runs every physics update. So the answer would be update because this runs this one runs every frame. It updates every frame. I might say. So the answer is B. Number two, which of the following is a proper in initialization of a vector three? So uh, the problem with this question, uh, problem with this answer is there's no new keyword before vector. Um, this one doesn't have new or um, a vector three. This one would be the correct answer because it incorporates everything you need. The issue with this one is it's a vector two, not a vector three. So the answer will be C. Um, which line of code properly gets whether he is key pressed? There's a bit of a typo here. He is twice. Hopefully they didn't um, remove the meaning. But input that key down, that gets whether um, uh, you press the key down in that frame, not whether it is currently pressed. Um, input that get key um, gets if the key is currently pressed. So this would be the answer. Get key up. Not only is it not using input dot, but it's also this gets when the key is released in that frame. So the correct answer would be B. What is the value of vector three dot forward? Um, forward is the Z axis. So it will be um, a C because there's a one in the Z axis. And which axis modifier allows for um, uh, allowing edits, the values in the inspector? Um, uh, both serialized field and public allow for you to edit the value in the inspector. So the answer would be C, A, and B. Um, what does game modifier define do? Um, it, it does find the object with the name that you input. So it would be A. It doesn't find multiple objects. It only finds one object. And there's no way to search based off just components. So the answer would be A. Um, and how do you um, uh, how do you get whether a user clicked a mouse button in this frame? Well, input that get mouse is incorrect. Um, uh, get button is incorrect. Get mouse button is correct um, uh, syntax wise. However, that gets whether the mouse button is currently pressed. So it'd be input that get mouse button down. So the answer is D. How you get a component on a game object? Um, so you'd use the get component function, which all of these have. However, the syntax is slightly off. You do need these um, uh, less than and greater than signs to surround the components. Um, so they're n you do need to specify the component. And the component type is not in the parentheses. So it would be a, because the component type is in the less than and greater than signs. So for number nine, how do you how do you get how much the mouse moved since last frame? Um, uh, for number a, number a, for a, um, uh, get mouse is not a function, so this would be incorrect. Um, uh, b would be the correct answer is get axis and the axis names are correct mouse x and mouse y. The capitalization does matter here. Um. Uh, even though it wasn't apparent here, the capitalization does matter. Get mouse axis is not a function, and get mouse move is also not a function. So it's input dot get axis. And the proper syntax for a serialized field. Um, right here, this is not a serialized field; it's invisible to the inspector. This one serialized field is inside the closed brackets or square brackets, whatever you want to call them, which is correct. Private float value equals zero. This is all correct. So this would be the correct answer. For C, serialized field must be in the square brackets. So this is incorrect. And serialized field is not a type. 
so you don't replace float with it. So this would be incorrect. So the answer is B. All right, if not, then we can transition to doing the lecture notes. Okay. Um, actually, I'll just share my screen. I'll share a whiteboard. Okay. So the first topic for today is arrays. So when you think of arrays, you can think of small storage compartments. So um, we have small storage compartments like this, a small continuous storage compartments. So, and in each compartment, you can have a specific value but all of the all of the compartments need to have the same type of values. For example, um, you can have all uh all of the com compartments have integer values, or you can have all string values. You can have all character, or you can have all um double value float values. But you cannot interchange them. You can't have one compartment have an integer value or one have a string value. So one thing to note when doing arrays is that the indexing or the counting starts from zero, not one. So we will label our first storage compartment as zero. The second one will be one. And the third one will be two. And you can assign values to each compartment. So for example, if I'm doing an integer array, I'll assign this, for example, like one, two, three. So this is the main idea behind arrays. It's basically just a continuous store, a continuous storage of compartments, which you can access. So you can store a lot of values in one place instead of ha having to create like 20 variables. So um, let's look, take a look at this in code. Okay, so I have my compiler here. So to declare an array, you do int, and you have to add brackets here. A, well, this is the name of the array, so I'm just choosing A here, equals new int. And then in this box right over here, you enter the size of the array. So if you want to make a array of size five, I'll, you can put five here. And then basically what this did is that it created five boxes in the memory. Like so this, and they're numbered from zero, like I mentioned before, so zero, one, two, three, four. And now if I want to access this box right over here, which is the first one, I would do A, at the zeroth location equals one. So now what this line of code did is that it put one in this box right over here, which is the first one. And you can do this for the rest of the boxes like a one equals two, a two equals three, a three equals four, and a four equals five. One thing to note is that if you go beyond this, the compiler will throw an error because you do not have six boxes because we started counting from zero. So you cannot access a sixth box in this because there's only five. So it's gonna throw an error if you do that. Now, if you wanna print something from uh, from the array, so you can do console.write line. For example, if you wanna print the last value, we'll just do array four. I mean, a four, not array four. So now let's try running this. Should print five, yeah. So that's how we access values in arrays. And you can also print out the length. Console.write line a dot length. So note that length is not length is a variable and it's not a method. So you, you don't have to add the brackets. You can just do a dot length. So this should print five. Yeah. And now if you want to print everything in the array. Let's do a blank, blank line here so we can do the contrast. We can use a for loop to print everything in an array. So x is, int x is less than zero, x is less than a dot length, x plus plus, 
console dot right line a x So what this is doing is that basically it's going to loop from x equals 0 to x to 5. This is basically 5. And for each one, it's going to print the x at that point. So it's going to, it's going to print a 0 because x is 0 initially in the first iteration. And then it's going to increment x by 1. And it's going to check the condition again. So 1 is less than 5. So then it's going to print a equals 1. And it's going to keep doing this until it reaches four, because when it reaches four, it's going to increment to five and five is not less than five. It's equal to five. So it's not going to execute after that point. So we're at the end. We're just going to have a zero to a five, a four printed on our console. So by default, the if I don't initialize this, it's just going to initialize all of the values as zero for integer, which is another thing. Yeah, and you can also um access the values individually by just doing a three annual dot. That's what it will print. Okay, so now moving on to array list. Uh, we, lists are basically just like arrays, but they don't have a specific size. So you know how here we have to initialize the size here? Uh, we don't have to do that for list because in arrays, you cannot change the size later on in the program. It has, it has, it's not a dynamic array. And array list is basically just a version of array, but it's dynamic. So let's declare that here. List, I'm declaring an integer one. New list. So now list works a little bit different. So you have to use the add method to add values to it. So a dot add 20, for example. And then you can also access this in the normal array way. So you can do a zero. You can do console dot write line a zero. And it will print the value. Oh, I have to import my array class. So then it will print 20, which is what we added in the array. So you can also remove values. So you can do, so let's add some values. So if you want to remove a value from this, you can do a dot remove, remove 20, for example. So that'll remove the value 20. And if you want to remove a value at a specific index, you can do a dot remove at, you can do a dot remove at index one, which will remove the value at index one. But be careful. So we removed 20 here, right? So after this, our array is just 30 comma 40. So at this point, it's going to remove the value at index one, which is 40. So it's, we're just going to be left with 30. A lot a lot of mistakes that people make is that they um, they do this line of code first, and then they do this. So they mess up their indexing. So you should always go from top to bottom and doing these type of problems. So you don't mess up the, uh, you don't mess up your indexes because there's a, uh, whenever you add something, it's going to affect the, or you remove something, it's going to affect the next few methods that you use. OK, and then the last thing that we have here is, oh, this should be remove at. OK, the last thing we have here is a.clear, which basically just uh, clears the array and removes everything from it, and uh, array list and removes everything from it. And that's basically just a reason, a quick introduction to a reason array list. Um, before we move on, can we have a pop quiz?
All right, so for this pop quiz, um, uh, going from top to bottom, um, uh, a lot of you mistakenly put the first one, um, uh, the syntax for the first one, um, uh, int brackets list is equal to new int brackets. That is an array, um, uh, that's not a list. So remember the difference between an array and a list. An array, you cannot change the size of an array. You can change the last size of a list. So there is an important difference there. Um, going down, um, in the second prompt list, uh, list equals your new list. There is no you're not specifying the type of list, so which is why that's incorrect. And then there is list int list equals new list int. Um, that's the correct answer. You're um uh, specifying the type of list it is, and you're making a new list. And initializing it to a new list. So that's good. So yeah, just remember the difference. Most of your syntaxes are right. You just need to remember the difference between a list and an array, which you'll get there. So moving on to um a second pop quiz. Now All right, for this quiz, most of you got it, which is great. Um, as I said before, an array is a fixed size. Um, a list, you can change the size and add more elements. Most of you got that, which is great. Um, you can edit a list, um, uh, and you can edit a, an array. So the third option is false. And you can read values from both an array and a list. So the only functional difference is a array is a fixed size and a list isn't. All right, moving on to um, actual Unity stuff. There's something called a trigger collider, which is essentially a regular collider, except it doesn't, quote, collide with stuff, but it will tell you when something has entered its space. So this is useful if you have like a cutscene that you want to trigger when a player enters a space. So on the top right here, to turn a collider into a trigger collider, you need to enable the is trigger property. I'll give it a check mark. And when you've done that, there are three callbacks that you need. Um, the on trigger enter, on trigger exit, and on trigger stay. Um, for something to trigger any one of these, it must have a collider. So that's what this pr um, uh, parameter here is. It, um, a Unity will give you a reference to the collider of the other objects. if if you want to do something to the object, teleport it somewhere or whatever you want to do to it. And these, um, a callbacks are pretty self-explanatory. On trigger enter is called when something initially enters the collider. It's called once. On trigger exit is the same, except when something exits the collider, it's called once. And on trigger stay um, uh, happens every frame where the collider is still in the area. So you may want to use on trigger enter or on trigger exit for a cutscene, and then maybe you want to use on trigger stay for something else, depending on what you have planned. And then there's also a concept called instantiating game objects. It's a bit of a big, big word, but it essentially means spawning. Um, there are two main ways to instantiate a game object. You have um, uh, the instantiate function, which you have um, uh, different ways to use this function. And you can just create a new game object. Um, uh, you'd want to use instantiate when you have an object you want to copy. Let's say you have a prefab for a bullet that you want to um, uh, create every time the player clicks left click or an enemy, let's say, that you want to spawn every so often. Um, uh, versus just creating an empty object and then doing whatever you want to do with it, adding your own stuff to it from scratch. And then obviously there are different ways to use the instantiate um, uh, function. Um, it does return the object it creates. So just like in this example here with new game object, you can assign the instantiate function into a variable and then do whatever manipulation you want to it.
and they're diff and then there are different versions of the functions for different things. You can assign a parent to the function. And then um, if you assign a parent, you can instantiate in world space or local space. Essentially meaning, will the new object spawn at the parent object or at the world origin? Zero comma zero comma zero. You can also edit the position and rotation and then edit the transform or the parent transform. Right. And then um, uh, Unity has a built-in physics engine, which you can interact with using the rigid body component. Um, uh, rigid bodies allow you to interact with their, um, uh, you can add forces, you can add torques, and you can add velocities. A torque, if you haven't heard of one before, um, a torque is basically a rotational force. Um, uh, so there are these functions, add force, um, add explosion force, and add torque. And then there is the rigid body dot velocity field that you can access and change how you wish. It's just a regular vector three. They can change just the same as position or um, a rotation in a or scale in a, um, a transform. So um, a, there is, for at force, there is a vector three saying where is the force going in 3D space. And there is the force mode. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a second. There's add explosion force, which is great for well explosions, obviously. Um, this does not apply to multiple game objects or multiple rigid bodies. It only applies to the rigid body you call it on. So if you want to have a bunch of objects in a pile and explode them all, you're going to need to call add explosion force to all of those rigid bodies. So just be aware of that. And the parameters of self-explanatory explosion force, explosion position, radius, upwards modifier, basically how much of the how much will the object go upwards from the explosion? Um but good if you want it to be cinematic and make things go up. And then there's add torque. Um uh, the torque will be along which axis do you want it to rotate on? X, Y, or Z. Of course, it can be multiple. And then, of course, the force mode. Um, force mode, there are um, uh, three or four different um, uh, versions of force mode. If I'm just going to open the documentation real quick. Um, according to the Unity documentation, there is force mode force, acceleration, impulse, and velocity change. Um, uh, these are the ways you can do it. Force is the regular forces you'd have in physics. Acceleration is just um, uh, ignoring the mass. Impulse will be an instantaneous change. It's a continuous change. And then velocity change would be um, uh, the same as impulse, but again, ignoring this mass. There are also some useful um, properties for rigid body. In the top right, you can change the mass, you can change the drag, you can change the angular drag, which is essentially the same as a drag, except for rotations. So if something is rotating, angular drag will make it slowly stop rotating. It can change whether it uses gravity or not. So if you want to float, obviously you said to not use gravity. Is kinematic is an interesting one. Um, it is kinematic, it changes whether forces and torques affect the rigid body. If you set it to be kinematic, um, no force will affect the rigid body, but the rigid body can still affect other rigid bodies as well. So if you want to make a character that can push objects around, they'll all have rigid bodies, but you don't want the character itself to be affected by the things it's pushing around, then you set the rigid body to is kinematic for the player. Interpolate. This is useful if you have really fast moving objects. Um, normally, because um, uh, the physic physics update is typically slower than your frame rate, if you have a really fast moving body, it will look like it's teleporting between places. Um, uh, interpolate can fix that. You can make it smoothly transition between the two places, depending on which option you select. 
collision detection. Um, uh, collision can, detection can get pretty complicated. Um, uh, and it's only really useful for like fast moving objects or objects that are rotating quickly. Um, uh, you can obviously detect the documentation. I'm not going to go in um, uh, to the different types of collision detection because they can, it can get pretty complicated. If you want to learn more, then the documentation is where you could check. And there are constraints. Constraints are pretty useful. It means that um, uh, the rigid body won't move or rotate into axis due to physics. Um, uh, if I constrain the rotation in all three axes, I can still change the transform of the object to rotate in that axis, but physics won't rotate it. That's what that means. So if I, if I freeze the position, I can still manually set the position to somewhere else, but physics won't change the position itself. This is useful if, let's say, you have a character um, uh, that you don't want to fall over. You can freeze its rotation so it doesn't fall over, but it can still change the player's rotation. So this is where um, uh, constraints are pretty useful. And I'd also like to point out that um, uh, the Unity documentation in general is a very good resource for a lot of the stuff. Um, uh, the manual has a lot of information on graphics, physics, scripting, UI. We haven't touched on UI at all yet, but um, uh, uh, the Unity documentation goes really in depth in UI and animation and audio and all that stuff. Then there's also the scripting API, which contains um, uh, all of the actual scripting parts of it. So if you have questions on like, what can I do with a rigid body? It's called rigid body. What can I do with a rigid body? Search for it. It's the first thing right here. And then it tells you with detailed explanation what everything you can do with the rigid body is. With even stuff that haven't gone over here, like sleep threshold or solve iterations. Most of the stuff we won't need to use, but like just know that this documentation is here. But if you need to learn more about a transform, you're able to figure out what you need to do with it, right? So just be aware of that. And I think now we can have a pop quiz. All right, so the correct answer is on trigger inter. Um, uh, going from top to bottom, on inter trigger, um, uh, um, uh, trigger and inter have swap places. On trigger, um, uh, when is the question you should be asking here? Um, uh, there's, um, it doesn't tell you when this callback is, um, uh, happening. So this is false, and when in trigger enter um but it's not common to use when for this kind of stuff it's usually on so the correct answer is on trigger enter all right so for this question which is not a real way to instantiate a game object. Um, instantiate prefab variable that is a proper syntax. You have um uh, inputted a pre um a uh, prefab which would be a, a game object, which is so this one is incorrect because it's a real way to instantiate a game object. Um, a game object ob obj is equal to new game object. Um, you can instantiate a game object by just creating a new game object. Um. Uh, Going back to the slides here, this is a valid way to instantiate a game object. Um, uh, so this would be incorrect because it is real. It does return an empty game object with literally nothing beside the transform. The correct answer would be just instantiate. Because if you look over here, all forms of the instantiate um, function have an object parameter. You must input a parameter for you to instantiate a game object this way. So the incorrect one would be just instantiate. I realize I didn't share it. Um, uh, and then 
the bottom one instantiate pivot variable vector three dot zero quaternion dot identity. That is a proper way. Um, uh, you do have proper um, uh, um, uh, parameters. So the incorrect one would be the um, uh, the the fake one, which is the correct one, would be the third one. Just instantiate with nothing, with no parameters. Um, you don't tend to just create a new game object, though. So, um, uh, normally just instantiate um, a game objects. So, just be aware of that. All right, for this question, um, uh, hmm. it depends if it's been a typo. Um, at explosion forces not should not have been the correct answer, but apparently it is. The the one that's not a function is add gravity force. That one's not a function. Going back to the slides, add force, add explosion force, and add torque are all functions you can use to interact with the game object. Um, uh, all doing what they say, adding a force, adding an explosion like force, and adding a torque. Um, uh, adding a gravity force is not a real function because gravity is handled using the use gravity um, uh, check mark in the properties of the rigid body. And then if you want to change how much gravity there is, you can go into the project settings. Or you can obviously input it manually if you know a bit of physics. But um, you don't need us automatically using the use gravity check mark. So add gravity force is not um a um a, is not a real function. So that that should have been the correct answer, but apparently we've done a typo. That's our our fault. A rigid body again. A rigid body. Um, if you want to create one in Unity, um, if you just open Unity real quick. That would be under add components, um, uh, physics, and then it'll be rigid body near bottom. Or you can just search in rigid body and it'll be the regular rigid body, not a 2D version, the regular one. Uh, so how do you create a rigid body? What's that? How do you create a rigid body, like a character? Um, just a rigid body by itself. Yeah, like how do um, you create a character that can does an animation? Um, uh, well, for a character, um, uh, you'd create a you'd have a rigid body on the character, and then you'd edit the velocity of the rigid body directly, based off what inputs the um a user are doing. Because you can, um, uh, let me just make an example here real quick. Let's add a rigid body here. Get a I'm just gonna add a test script here. So uh, we can do Okay, so first of all, let's get the <clears throat> rigid body. So once we'll I have the rigid body, what you can do is let's do rigid body dot velocity, and with this you can um uh, you can edit the velocity directly based off what inputs the user are doing. So you can have what I would do is have a variable a vector three. Uh, let's do movement input equals vector three dot zero and then you can do if input dot um a get key key code dot w let's say movement input plus equals so i'm adding um a transform dot forward and then i can copy this set this to s instead 
And instead of transfer dot forward, I'm going to multiply by negative one. So then it's the backwards direction. And then you'll do the same thing for um, uh, A and D. But instead of, um, let's do D and A instead. Instead of forward, you do right. And then you do rigid body dot velocity and set that to movement input. So not this movement input. So this is the basic um, a setup for a character controller to use the rigid body, just directly setting the velocity to which buttons, um, uh, based off which buttons the player is putting in. And then you can use um, uh, get access to turn the rigid body and turn the camera around and do all that. The reason we're using transform that forward here instead of vector three dot forward is because if the rigid body turns, let's say forty five degrees to the left, vector three dot forward would be in that new direction forty five degrees to the left. Um, uh, or transform dot forward will be forty five degrees to the left, right? Vector three dot forward won't turn with the rigid body. So that's so. Then based off this, you can. Then turn the rigid body just using transform dot rotation equal to quaternion dot Euler. And then you can have, let's say, let's uh, get um, uh, axis mouse x. Wait, no, this won't work. Um, uh, no, this won't work. Um, uh, for rotation, you need to like have a variable up here. Float, let's say, yaw, float, pitch. And then increase these based off input.getAxis, mouseX, and mass y, And then do transform.rotation is equal to quaternion.euler. The reason we're using quaternion.euler is, is because this is in a better format we can understand just X, Y, Z, rather than quaternion being a four dimensional um, number that is pretty complicated to work with. So Euler is a lot simpler. And then I believe it's um, a, yeah, zero, zero. And then whatever your camera, you do the same thing, but replace, I believe the third number okay. with pitch. Um, for rotation, you need to experiment around a bit. I don't remember exactly how it works. I need to do a bit of experiment myself. But this is the basic setup for a character controller using the rigid body. And also... With animations? Um, for animations, animations are a bit more complicated. Um, uh, you need to create some... Uh, the Unity documentation goes aligned to animations. Um, uh, that's just for a basic moving around. You need to have an animation controller. You need a, what's it? You need to have a bunch of like just animations, set them up to your controller, you need to rig them. Um, it's a bit more complicated. Um, you don't really need it for this course, but if you go into the, where is it? Documentation, go to the manual. It, has a lot about animation and stuff in here. Um, and it has a lot of tutorials as well. So, um, uh, like, it has a lot of information. So if you want to like animate characters, this is where you'd go to, to learn, or just go to YouTube, as well. That's what works. All right. Um, let's get started with our classwork now. Um, for our first classwork question, uh, let's create a wall that gets disabled. Um, I came out to get the set active false when something with the collider gets near it using a trigger collider. So using a trigger collider to see if something is close, disable the wall. I want to give some time and if anyone needs help, then we can check in after. Or if nobody wants to share an answer, then I can 
show the solution. So first off, let's make a new game object of a cube. And then let's make this really wide and really tall to act as like a wall. And to use figure colliders, let's, let's add a new collider. Let's just play a box collider. By the way, you can have two colliders of the same type. That's not an issue. Let's set this new box collider to be a trigger. And let's increase its size to be slightly larger than the wall itself. Like this. Maybe let's increase the size a little bit. This looks good. Then let's make a script. Um, let's see. And then in this script, we can remove all these basic functions. You can add uh, private private void on trigger enter. We're gonna do game object dot set active to false. So with this, let me go back to Unity. We can create a new object. Let's just say, I don't know, a sphere. Let's move it a little bit away so you can see what happens when you move it closer to the collider. Let's go back to scene view. Now, let's move the collider to the sphere closer. And all right, let's work on the next question for now. Create a rigid body that, quote, jumps up whenever it gets near using a trick collider. What I mean by jumps is just have a force that's vertical. Just I'm um, at a force that's vertically up. All right, I'm just gonna specify something now that I forgot to specify earlier. Um for a trigger to be triggered, the object that's triggering it must have a rigid body. Even if it's kinem even if it's set to kinematic, so it's not being affected by gravity it needs to have a rigid body for it to affect it. So just be aware of that. I forgot to mention that, that's my fault. Um, uh, so yeah, just be aware that you need to have a rigid body for the trigger to be triggered by the object and also as well as the collider. Can you go to that? I'm sorry, what's that? Can you the code to that? The code for this right here? Yeah. I just had to on trigger stay. You can set to on trigger enter for the same effect. Um, uh, it just game object just set active disables the game object on entering the collider. So, yeah, you need to you need to have a um a rigid body for a trigger to be for a trigger to detect an object. Are you sure it's the answer? Are you sure thing I can show the answer now? Yeah. So for the setup in Unity, uh, you can delete these two objects. I'm going to create a, um, a plane so that this can be where the um, a box is bouncing off of. Then I'll create a cube. I'm going to move it up a little bit. And then I'm um, a uh, I'm going to add a boss collider. Set it to be a trigger and then increase the size to, let's say, 0.1. And then for the plane, I'm going to add a rigid body and set it to is kinematic and disable gravity so that it's not being affected by anything else. It just stays there. And then I'm going to make a, um, a new script. Yeah, by the way, I have a question. So I made a rigid body for my main camera. And when I just press play, the main camera just suddenly dropped. Is that because I enabled um, gravity for it? Yes, that's that's what gravity is doing. Um, What you could do is either disable gravity, or if you don't want any like physical forces or torques to be applied on it at all, you can enable is kinematic. I mean, if you enable is kinematic, then 
it will affect other things, but won't be affected if that's what you want, or it can disable gravity. So going back to the um, uh, jump script here, how we do this is we use the private void on trigger enter callback. Then, well, first of all, we also need to get access to the rigid body. So let's do rigid body underscore rigid underscore rigid body. And in the private void start callback, we can do rigid body is equal to get component dot get component rigid body. This just sets the rigid body variable to the rigid body that we have on our box. Then we could do rigid body dot add force. Um, uh, we can do vector three the up. So it's going to be the global up direction. And we can do force mode. Let's say just impulse. So it's an instantaneous. Um, a force, and then we can go back to Unity, and you can see this works. Oh, did I add a rigid byte to this? I did not add a rigid byte to this character. Can you do that? So let's try that again. And you add a rigid byte to this character. And then, okay, I think what happened here is the force is not great enough. Considering the mass, so let's decrease the mass and try again. And yep, it just got into space because the mass is so small. <laughs> so um, uh, you might experience this problems as well when using rigid bodies that it looks like it's not really doing anything. However, realize that um, uh, if your mass is one, but your force is also one, because the vector three to up is zero comma zero comma one, uh, sorry, zero comma one comma zero. The length of that um, uh, vector is one. If your force is one and your mass is one, it's not gonna move. So if I multiply this by say, um, uh, three, then by default, it should bounce up. And yep, it is bouncing, but then it then has a problem of settling down, which you can, you can fix that problem if you want to, but it really not, isn't really that necessary. So yeah, the solution, have a rigid body, have a box collider with a is trigger. Then for your bottom plane, have a rigid body on a bottom plane that is set to is kinematic, so it doesn't move around. Then grab the rigid body from your cube and then on trigger enter or on trigger stay. This will solve the problem with settling. If you want to make it more chaotic, use rigid body to add force either up, multiply it by some amount, or you can just velocity mode dot force mode dot velocity change. That will also fix the issue. Any one of those, anything similar to this, that's the same result, will be good enough. Right. Moving on to the next question. Create a pile of rigid bodies that all quote explode and press space using the um uh, using the add explosion force function. Can you have a small question? Yep. Can you just like put up how to initiate? I mean, on how to. How do you get a component? Like, can you put up the callbacks for different oh, oh, for rigid the, body? Yeah. For that trigger. Um uh, the different callbacks will be 
right here. I'm just gonna copy these and put it in another slide. All right, because we're running out of time here, I'm going to just start a solution. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this um, a plane here. We don't need a rigid body on this plane, so I'm gonna remove that. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to add a, um, a cube. And notice where this cube is. Uh, wait, I'm gonna move this to zero comma zero. Just so this is where the explosion is going to emanate from, just so I know where that is. I'm just gonna move up this plane to so that it sits on top of it over zero comma zero over the origin. Then I'm gonna move this cube up. I'm gonna give it some components. I'm gonna give it a rigid body and a new script. An explode script is what I'm gonna call it. Right, and then editing the script. I'm gonna to try to get the rigid body. So rigid body underscore rigid body. Rigid body is equal to get component rigid body. And then if I'm a inputs dot get key down key code dot space. If that's then rigid body dot add explosion force is the function you'd use. The force, let's just say, I don't know, 100F. I don't know how much this is gonna be, but let's try it. Let's set it to start at the origin. So vector 3.0, explosion radius. Again, let's just say 20. Upper modifier, say zero for now. And in force mode, let's just do force mode dot impulse. And I suspect the 100 will be a bit much, but we'll see. And then that will only work for this one cube. So let's create copy of the cube. Just control C, control V. We can move this around. And then we can select all four of them using shift click, make just make it faster. Control C, control V. And we can make a big pile of these. All right, and then when we hit play, we're gonna press space. Yep, all of these exploded far away. Let me see where they went. So yeah, 100 was a bit much, but that's fine. You can change around the values and play around with it. But yes, this is the main thing you wanna do. And then I'm a- Yeah, can we copy it down? What's that? We copy this. You just just give us a second to copy sure. it. Um, uh, you can uh, you can always use um a uh, control C and control V to copy multiple stuff at a time. There's also a shortcut control D to duplicate. Um, but uh, it comes in useful sometimes for situations like this. And then uh, the shift clicking comes in useful a lot. So that's something to know of. All right, just wait for me a bit to copy it. All right. Um, uh, I'm just going to show the solution for the next one. Create wait, could you copy. also copy the first steps down? The first steps? Yeah, the script that is above. What's that? The above script. I'm sorry, I don't think I understand what you're asking for. You mean the other the script that's above? The rigid body, rigid body, rigid body, get confirmed in rigid body. Oh, you mean this? Yeah. 
All right. Um, I'm also need to make an announcement. Um, we will have a group project coming up. Um, uh, about Unity. So um, uh, uh, think about what you want to do. Um, uh, we will be assigning groups. So yeah, think about that. Um, also, if you do want to learn um, uh, more about Unity, I think the best way is just try to do problems that you don't know how to do, and figure out how to do them because th that way you learn a lot more about the engine than just um uh, doing stuff you know how to do. So yeah, in your time off, um, uh, I recommend practicing the engine and trying problems that you don't know how to do. Do your time constraints. Um, uh. I'm just going to say this for the next problem here, which is create a script that will spawn a list of game objects as 0, 0, 0 when you hit space. So how we do this, um, uh, let's just use this test script here. OK, so first off, I'm going to make a list. So I'm just going to make a serialized field list game object. Call it um a, a game objects equals new, a new list game of game objects. Serialized field because I want to set this in the inspector so I can set the game objects that it is. Then if um input dot get key down um uh, let's do um a key code dot space. The reason I'm using get key down, not get key, is because um uh, if you're running at a high frame rate, um uh, which you usually are at in these like projects that have nothing in them, um if you hold down space even for a second, that could cause like you spawn that could that could have five hundred frames for just one second. So you don't want to spawn like a thousand objects by just holding down space. So it's get so I'm using get key down so it spawns um, uh, all the objects once. Then we can do a for loop. We can do game objects dot count. For a list is not length, it's count. Game objects dot count, and then we can do instantiate game objects of i. So just let instantiate the ice game object that we have in the list up to the number of game objects that we have in the list. And it'll just spawn them at the origin. So going back here, we can remove all these cubes you have here. And then we can just add the test script to whatever is that to the main camera. And then now we have the option to create a list of game objects here. So let's just say, let's just add a cube, just list. And then we can turn this cube into a prefab so that we can then delete the cube from the scene and then it'll still be, we can still assign the cube here. So you can assign a, a prefab as a to a game object variable. That's something that's very useful. So this cube could be like anything, an enemy, a, um, a bullet, whatever. You can even add um, a multiple of the same cube or we can turn the direction directional light as a prefab. And then add the directional light in here. So when we play, I press space. See it adds cubes and the uh, lights. I don't know why these are moving, but I think something from a script I'm using. But yeah, now we have every time I press space. Bonds of game objects. You can see why we're not using um a get key instead of get key down. We don't want to spawn forty thousand game objects from holding space. It's a little bit too long. And then when you something to note, when you stop testing, when you stop playing, all the game objects that you spawned in disappear. So only game objects that so yeah, all the game objects that you spawn during runtime disappear. So it goes back to the original state. And that's what you know in general. Um, uh, when you stop playing, um, uh, the entire scene, including all like variables, all prefabs, uh, all game objects, all properties for all game objects, 
will go to the original state. So, and yeah, that's it for this problem. Any questions on uh, anything we've covered at all? All right, this should be it. Um, uh, you, you should be free to go now. Remember about the homework. And if you have any questions, feel free to stay in and we can answer them. Wait, I have a thing. It says they couldn't find it. What's that you're required right now? Huh? What do you say? It, it couldn't find the rigid body. Um, uh, this means that there's no rigid body on your game object, so... Yeah, but I um, put a rigid body on my cube. Um, uh... Are you sure the script is on your... It could be that you put your script in something else, and then it can't find a rigid body on that something else? I put my script as a component on a cube. And then that... And the cube has a rigid body, right? Yeah. Hmm. Um. Uh, does that air persist if you try to like, um. Uh, if you yeah, can you show my screen. Um. Uh, sure. This issue it says cannot find a rigid body, but this cube has a rigid oh, body. I think I know what's going on. Um, uh, head over to your code. Yeah. Um, uh, so inside of the less than equal signs of the get component segment, um, uh, you don't put the name of your variable. You put the actual type. So. Um, you see where it says underscore rigid body equals get component underscore rigid body. Yeah. With that second underscore rigid body, replace it with remove the underscore. Um, what's going on there is get component tries to look for a um a, a class or a variable type. Um. Uh, so in that in between those like less than equal less than and greater than signs, we put the actual type of variable. Okay. And if you're trying to um uh, make it explode, um uh, you, input is only accepted in the game view. So if you're trying to press space, uh, only if you only press space in the game view, just letting you know. Wait, the rigid body works in the scene as well? Um, like, well, that's because you're currently running the game. So the scene view is the um, uh, what's going on in the game, you can see in the scene view. So there's no difference between the, the world of the scene view and the game view. They're both in the same like environment. However, um, uh, the scene view is just like an overall like view, or well, the game view is what your player will actually see. Um, uh, so you can interact with the actual game, the scene view while it's playing, yes. And just note that um, uh, if you're editing the scene in um, uh, the game view, when you um, uh, go back to, when you pause, when you stop playing, um, uh, everything will re default back to what it was before. Right. Does anybody else here have any questions? When I press space, it doesn't explode. Um, uh, do you want to go back to your code? Yeah. 
um, it could be that the radius is very small. So you see where there's a 20 F yeah. um, increase this to some bigger number, like let's say a hundred or something. Yeah, that works. And then um, uh, you can save your code and try again. Also, how do, you, how do you make the base point like a smooth surface? Uh, what do you mean by a smooth surface? Yeah. Hmm? Like, things don't fall through the grid. Um, uh, things won't fall through it unless you move them to be, like, inside of them. Like, um, uh, no, under normal circumstances, things are not going to fall through. Unless you, um, uh, like, um, uh, if you move an object to be inside of something else, it's going to move out of that in the quickest way possible. So if you move an object to be like underneath an object, but still colliding with it, it's going to teleport underneath. But like under normal situations, that wouldn't happen. All right, thank you. Right. If you don't have any, uh, yeah. um, uh, does anybody else have any questions?